So I guess we're live. This is going to be an informal online live chat hangout today. And some people in the past have always said, why don't you tell us when you're going to do one of these so we can be around for your live feeds? And so I did that. I announced it in my last Friday um, Q&A video and put that down in the video description, the times that uh, we would be available. So here it is at 4 o'clock, 4 or 2 already on the 21st of November. So if anybody shows up, you can ask questions all you want. And uh, we'll just shoot the breeze here. I picked this time because uh, I think maybe it's before football comes on and in uh, other parts of the world, you can still have time to be here. There's Mark Bidwell and uh, Dominican beekeeper from the Caribbean. That's a great place to be. I hope there aren't any pirates down there. And there's Abby Clint. So I'm hoping that... Uh, well, hello, everybody. So I'm glad. I guess uh, it worked out. And maybe some people got the information about the 4 o'clock uh, meeting here. So all we're doing, sitting around, drinking uh, coffee, hot chocolate, tea, whatever you do. And it's informal. We'll just talk about whatever's on your mind today for backyard beekeeping. So one of the things I wanted to talk about right off the bat is we just had a beekeeper meeting yesterday. And that was really good. And what I wanted to share was uh, a lot of people don't belong to beekeepers associations. A lot of people just go online and uh, get their information from YouTube and things like that. But I encourage you to join a beekeeping association just because you'll develop a fellowship of beekeepers and you can question and challenge and debate each other's practices. And I think that's a really good thing to do. So anyway, okay, so if people are asking questions right away, we'll jump right into that. And I'm glad that we have so many people getting in here. What time of the hot box do you recommend in the Arizona desert temp? And that's from, uh, oh, I can't even say that first name, Corba Juge. Anyway, the Arizona desert. Well, honeybees, by the way, any beehive, the Langstroth hive works in desert regions. How do we know that? Because Dr. Thomas Seeley tested, they stress tested honeybees in Hawaii on lava flows and things like that to see just how well they could keep up. So long as they have resources that they need to cool their hive, plenty of water and things like that, desert regions, the concern is that they'll dry out too much inside the hive. So you have to make sure they have plenty of uh, humidity available, moisture available, clear water. Don't put salt and everything in their only source of water. That's why the bees go after um, condensation. So they go after people's air conditioning units and stuff like that. But as long as the hives are well constructed, your bees can handle them. So what else are we doing here? Let's see. All is good here in Calgary, Canada. And yes, my, my streaming is clear now. Why? Because I've finally been hooked up to Armstrong Fiber Optics. Uh, now, uh, Dominican Beekeeper says, what do you think about acorn frames, likes and dislikes? Okay, so for those who don't know, an acorn frame is uh, plastic. Sometimes they have plastic foundations. Sometimes it's one piece, entire frame. And uh, those are heavy wax coated. And of all the plastic foundations and all the plastic one piece frames that I've evaluated, I've done a lot of them, acorn is my top pick. They're the number one heavy wax, plastic frame. If you're going to put plastic foundation in your beehive, single piece or the insulated portion, then I highly suggest that you get Acorn. They're better, I'm just gonna call it. They're better than Man Lake. They're better than Pure Co. Because I've tested all of those and I stress test them too. I put them in solar wax melters and things like that to see what they hold up to. And those are the ones that my bees go after first and draw out the quickest. So here's another question from William Berner. What is your opinion of the ape of my hives? I have one in my apiary and have been happy, but rarely hear mention of it in your presentations. That's true. That's because they don't have any. And I have chosen not to get the ape of my super insulated hives, but 
I'll send you to somebody who has a whole test yard full of them, and that's Cayman Reynolds. So if you go to Cayman Reynolds' website, you can uh, catch up with him and see how he likes ape my hives. Um, I just decided not to go that way. I can only do so many tests, so many different hive configurations. Cayman has a whole yard dedicated just to them, and they were donated to him. So I would check in with him. And there's Robert. Hello. And Lewis, I live in Houston Valley, New York. Moved 30 miles. My two hives haven't moved yet, and I don't know how to stop the feed from rolling. And uh, I'm moving in colder temps. Would it be ideal? A local beekeeper says to wait for spring. What do you think? Definitely, if you're moving hives and everything, uh, you can move in winter if you don't. If you can do that without taking your hives apart, but because uh, if you wait for spring, things are going to be in high production. Spring is a time of increase or foraging. So in my opinion, if you can strap down your hives and close them up for transport, I think winter time is a really good time to do it. Andrick TV, Fred, watching from the Knee Healing Lounger, meeting at IHOP, 1 December, 9, Beekeep Breakfast. So Dr. Andrick is a member of our Beekeepers Association, and I believe he's the new president, if I'm saying that right. But uh, I really like the Beekeeping Association gathering. For those of you who don't know, I belong to the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. So if you are in Northeast Ohio, Western New York, or Northwest Pennsylvania and surrounding area, I invite you to check out the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. So there's a plug for that. And if you're not local to us, join some other beekeepers group. There are benefits to beekeeping groups other than obviously getting good information being in contact with people that are like-minded and so on. So uh, have you tried Premier Foundation? Premier Foundation, it's my understanding, is being pushed and claimed to have smaller cells imprinted in them, and I don't see them as a huge um, benefit. <clears throat> Some people choose small cell foundations so that uh, they can develop smaller bees or what's referred to as regressed honeybees. So they're smaller than the others. And the thinking was that they would occupy smaller cells and that the varroa destructor might would not get a leg up in there. And then of course that was tested, followed up. Cornell University did studies and uh, proved that that was not the case. So making smaller bees and putting them on small cell foundation has not proven to be a benefit uh, for varroa destructor mite control. Also, some people will say, well, then more cells, more honey, or more cells, more bees, possibly more bees. But if they're smaller, they can carry less honey than a larger bee. The other thing is more cells, more honey. I don't think that really works because more cells, more cell walls, therefore more honey consumed to fabricate the walls, therefore not necessarily more honey. So um, it's just not on my radar for the reasons that they claim that they are a benefit. I don't, you know, where I live would not be a benefit for me. Uh, William Berner says, thanks. Hope to see you January at the Hive Alive. Hive Alive conference. I'm going to be there. Hope you will be there too in Tennessee. It's put on by Cayman Reynolds. There's going to be over 700 attendees. I don't know how anybody's going to have time to visit with everybody. But uh, lots of great presenters there, lots of great companies putting their stuff on sale so you can go there, pick them up, and so on. So look into the Hive Life Conference if you're looking for somewhere to go. In January, I'm there. I'm on. I'm billed as uh, being there. A lot of people have asked what my topic is for presentation, but guess what? I'm not presenting. I'm just going to be there, and I'm going to interview uh, people that are selling stuff and other YouTubers and other beekeepers that teach about bees. We're just going to talk. So I'm going to be around just to shoot the breeze. And uh, let's see what else. Castle hives. Keeping my bees away from neighbors' swimming pools. Keeping your bees, by the way, this is a great time to talk about that. Keeping your bees out of your neighbor's swimming pool. That is the neighborly thing to do. Keep them away from that. First thing in spring, your scouts are going to go out and they're going to look for resources. One of the prime resources they're going to look for is going to be a water source. And this is why I've done studies with the water composition. So we have fresh water out and available at feeding stations that must remain constant, set location. And then we have other, other uh, water systems out there that have minerals in them. So we use uh, sea salts and things like that, even pink Himalayan salt. 
So all these studies were done, we put them out. And if you can get the early foragers to go to your established water sources first, and if they can get the mineral content that they need, that's also, also often why they go after people's swimming pools. They will be, uh, sometimes those are salt pools and things like that. So we want to get them in the habit of using the water sources that you've put out first. So that's an early spring activity, set up your water oasis and help deter those bees from going to your neighbor's swimming pool. So give them what they need somewhere else. And that has to be done early because they're victims of habit, they share with each other and they do their waggle dance and they all go after different things. Uh, Crescent City, California had a hive that absconded. I froze frames full of capped honey. How long can they remain frozen before be feeding back to other hives. Okay, here's what I do not recommend you do to other hives. When honeybees abscond, for those of you who don't know, absconding means they departed the hive completely. That's different from a swarm. It means they left for some reason that you may not even be aware of. So if they left a bunch of honey behind, you can harvest that honey and use it for yourself. I would not recycle honey, honey from a hive that absconded into other hives because of potential spread of pathogens to those other bees. Maybe even the reason why your bees absconded and left those resources behind. Uh, I would use it for myself, harvest the honey, not feed it back to the bees, unless it was back to the original colony that the honey came off of. And that's my policy for honey taken off of any hive. If you're gonna feed honey back, it needs to go to the hive that produced it. Uh, let's see. Bill Robinson, happy Sunday. Enjoyed your video this week. Thank you so much. Larry Lee's Bees. Thank you, Larry, for being here. Uh, will nectar or uncapped frames last over winter next four months if placed in a fridge or will they spoil? Here's the thing. If it's uncapped um, nectar or uncapped frames, if it's uncapped, I don't recommend putting that in your refrigerator because it can still have a high water content. It may not have been dehydrated down enough to be finished honey. And if you're going to put it anywhere over winter, freeze it. Because freezing does a couple of things for any honey, capped or uncapped. One, uh, it's going to keep it from fermenting. And number two, it will keep it from crystallizing. Sometimes your honey will crystallize right in the cells if you don't extract and process it quick enough. And then you've got a frame full of uh, capped honey that can't be extracted because it's crystallized. Now you have to feed it to who knows what, you know, because again, you only want to feed that back to the colony that came off from. Uh, Castle Hives will be there also. Howdy from Texas, St. Germain. Is Hive Life going to be at the conference? Do you know? Hive Life or Hive Alive? Hive Alive is going to be there. Let me plug them. To do Hive Alive, Irish company. They are going to be at the um, conference. That's one of the people that I'm going to be interviewing and producing some YouTube content while I'm at the uh, Hive Life conference. So we'll be talking to all those people, but yes, they're going to be there. Uh, we have to have water available close to the hives in New Jersey. Um, here's what I do. You know, I live in an area where the French Creek watershed, for example, is less than a mile from my property. I still put out what I call the garden hose oasis. And that's where I put pure water, water that runs up. By the way, for the garden hose, because I'm on a well, there's a lot of iron that goes through that. I use one of those RV camper inline filters that goes on your hose, and that took all the iron out. So, and peripheral to that, I put out uh, my fortified water that has uh, salts, minerals, and things like that. So the bees can pick and choose what they want. And those desires for minerals and salt water and things like that vary through the year. So it's not all the same, but what should be the same is the location of those resources when you put them out there. So yeah, even if you're in an area where it's a lot, uh, where there's a lot of water available, and I recommend still putting your own stuff out there. Let's see, full card, using flow frames for two years, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I can't get the bees to put honey in the flow frames. They only collect in the brood section. That is a very common problem. And I'm gonna tell you what my method is for getting the bees to go up into the flow supers. For those of you who don't know, what is a flow frame? This is what they look like. They're plastic, they're big, they're deeper than normal frames, right? And each one of these holds 
a half a gallon of finished honey. So the way I get them up in there is uh, they are from an invention called the Flow Hive that is out of New South Wales, Australia. And I've been using them since 2015. And the way I get my bees up in there, number one, I don't put a super on any hive that isn't already bustling with a lot of bees and that doesn't appear productive. So that's step one, big colony full of bees. The other thing is my habit is to put a second box on first. Usually it's a medium super because here in the Northeast, they need honey to get through winter. And I like them to do that first. So now I've got a deep brood box, eight or 10 frame makes no difference. And then the medium box, eight or 10 frame to match that. And then there's a six or seven frame flow super that goes on top of that. You're supposed to put a queen excluder between your flow super and of course the boxes below so that they don't lay eggs up in there. So I'm gonna tell you what I do, which is against the recommendations of the inventor of the flow hive. I do not put the honey I uh, do not put the queen excluder in there. I almost made a mistake and said the honey excluder, but they are synonymous. Queen excluders slow down honey production. So I don't put it in there and let the bees get up there and work it. Now, if you want to put a queen excluder on later, so the key is to get the bees up in the flow supers, in the flow frames, working them up because they have to seal the joints with propolis and wax. And they start to draw them out because they're also their surfaces are uneven and then they need to finish that off too. That's when you can, during an inspection, make sure that your queen is down below, then put your queen excluder in there. And then if there were a couple eggs laid up in there 21 days later, they're out of there too and they're just workers. So that's what you could do. And what I find to be most successful in getting my bees to go up and use flow supers, I don't use queen excluders. And that's because down in the brood box, above the brood, there is a box that is nothing but capped honey. Then there's a flow super. It's extremely rare for the queen to go up through that honey bridge, I call it, and up into your flow supers and start laying if she's got room and space to lay down below. So that's what I do. It's worked. Works really well, by the way. But you run the risk that they could actually lay up in your flow super unless you put that queen excluder up in there. Let's see, I have a pool and put out water sources. The bees tend to ignore both and use a cattle tank. Large pond, about 700 feet away. Cattle mm, and ponds, even a cow pie, for those of you who don't know what that is, when a cow goes to the bathroom, it produces a sloppy cow pie and then it rains and then the rain fills little voids on the surface of the cow pie and guess where your honeybees go? Right there, why? Because it's full of minerals. You can't help it sometimes. We can only do so much to control our bees. But luckily, the farmer has not complained that my bees go to cow pies. Uh, what else do we have? Bees are flying at 45 degrees to get sugar syrup. Heard they only fly in the upper 50s. What's your experience? And that's from Gary. My experience is, are you ready? Honeybees will forage at 49 degrees Fahrenheit. How do I know that? Because I've been doing those tests for the last three weeks. And uh, here's the thing that they do. Honeybees are conserving with their energy and resources, right? So what's the first thing that goes out in the morning? The scouts. The scouts go out. They find the resource that your hive needs. They come back. They tell the other residents of the hive, this is a resource. Do you want it? If they want it, now the foragers go out. So scouts go out to known resources first. So when I put out my sugar syrup, and in this case, for the test purposes, I was using Pro Health, Pro Sweet, sorry. Pro Sweet. Pro Health is a essential oil. Ignore that. Pro Sweet for Man Lake because it is the same consistency as honey. So if they bring that back on a cold day, uh, they're going to be able to consume and use it right away. So what I found was, and I put different calibrated thermometers out with those offerings. Scouts return to the spaces where they found the resources before. And then once they discover that it's still there, they fly back. And so from 49 degrees on up, 50, 51 degrees, and then 55 degrees, you get a real boost in the number of foragers that are there, and 60 and above, full-on shoulder-to-shoulder uh, collection of those resources. So they do forage, and they do get that stuff when the temperatures are colder, but here's what happens. If the liquid, if the honey itself, in this case the pro-sweet, 
What's that? And I'm telling you stuff I'm about to tell you in another video anyway, where I'm going to show you all of this testing that I did. The, uh, if it's 51 degrees or colder, and that means the syrup itself that you're offering, and it needs to be two to one this time of year, by the way, if they're flying at all and getting a, a resource like that, you can't be putting out, you could be putting out one to one, but it's not great because you bring too much moisture for too little gain. So pro sweet full strength. If it's colder than 51 degrees, they take some of that on board into their uh, little nectar bottles there into their honey crop and uh, they're grounded. It's too cold. They're grounded until they warm up. Now, if the weather didn't warm up more than that at that point, those bees are stuck right there. So then I put out two offerings of the identical syrup. One, 48 degrees Fahrenheit syrup temperature, even though they're flying in the 50s, and the other one at 60 plus degrees temperature. Identical syrup composition, the only difference was the temperatures. The colder syrup, the bees were drinking it and stuck right there. The ground was covered with cold, chilled, um, cold temperature shock, kind of like getting brain freeze when you eat too much ice cream or drink a milkshake too fast. And then the others were getting theirs, same climate, same environment, same environmental temperature. The only difference is the temperature of the feed they're taking. Uh, the ones that were in the warmed syrup were getting it flying out immediately. So it has an impact on them. Their ability to forage, 49 degrees and up. Their ability to collect and use the nectar. The nectar must be 51 degrees or warmer. Otherwise, when they take it on board, they're grounded. So very interesting stuff. Can't wait to put that out. So that's what I have found to be the case. And we ran the, the same um, experiments over and over with different thermometers. So we had to allow for uh, the variance in the accuracy of the thermometer because I expect those things to be challenged because I know the very common information put out is for it to be 55 degrees or warmer. And that proved not to be the case here. Uh, so Bo Lash, hey Fred, another veteran here. Thanks for your service. Where do you get your plans for five frame nukes or where do you find good ones? Okay, I can tell you. A nuke, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is a nucleus colony, five frames. I get mine from Better Bee, and I'm buying the three-quarter inch thick ones, the heavy-duty pine ones. They have the migratory covers on them, which, by the way, right now, those migratory covers also have two-inch thick uh, insulated covers on the outside of those. They work extremely well. So we did the five-frame nuke, which built up really well. Then we added, they also sell just the box. So it's a super that's five frames. So I basically have a 10-frame box that's a five over five. That is working really good. And about an hour ago, I was out doing thermal scans on all my hives. And uh, those colonies are doing really well. It's going to be impressive to see them come through. But I get them from Better Bee. And Better Bee offers two different types. So there's the ones that have the standard bottom board with the entrance on the bottom. And they also have the ones with the wheel on the front, the little three-quarter inch hole. And it's the one with the three-quarter inch hole that I put in there because I found that that is the easiest for them to defend, and actually they build up quicker in that. So it's really interesting stuff. Uh, Casey made it. Yeah, Brooklyn's honeybees. Evening, everyone. And yeah, talk amongst yourselves. Anyway, Rose Robertson says, put out two to one syrup at around 50 degrees. Lost a good number of bees. Not sure if it was due to the temperature or fighting, as they were fighting, as you would see on landing boards with robbing thoughts while well, they're fighting they're actually let's change it from fighting to competing for the resource you'll see in these videos and i've also put up time lapse sequences too they pile up on it and you know three four levels of bees deep they're not all even getting to the nectar source so they're competing for that resource and if it got cold and stay cold then uh, yeah this is one of the reasons i did the study in the first place so that we would know as beekeepers what temperatures could you safely put a nectar resource out like ProSuite and expect your foraging bees to make it back to the hive? That's why we're doing it. The other thing is we want to see at what temperature do the yellow jackets come out. The yellow jackets were coming out much earlier, and those are wasps, by the way, for those of you who don't know. So they were coming out earlier. So if we put an open feeding station out too early while it's too cold, all we're doing is favoring the wasps. And this time of year, that is the queens. So we want to wait till the temperatures are suitable for the bees when they can fly out and make it back. And the other thing is you don't leave the food resource out. You don't leave the nectar out. 
because it gets too cold and we want to keep it warm inside. And then so you'll be setting it out when it's warmed and the bees are in the 50s to go out and take advantage of that. So what else am I doing here? Calvin says, how good does cedar wood do on mites and wax moths and does it affect the honey or the wax? Plus, if a sugar water box made from cedar wood made with sugar water toxic. Cedar, and, and I get this question a lot, cedar, cedar shavings, cedar pillows and things like that, does that have an impact on uh, even varroa destructor mites and things like that? It really does not, and it does not deter wax moths either. And there's a lot of cedar boxes out there. 50% of my colonies are made out of cedar, western red cedar, and uh, it has no, those hives don't show any difference in uh, those pests. But uh, wax moths and things like that, if your hives are populated to the size of the hive, so if all of your boxes are full of bees and properly sized, then you're not really going to have a problem with wax moths and things like that. You usually find that as a problem in your stored equipment. Or when a colony has absconded, as was described earlier, the bees aren't there to defend it. You can expect wax moths and small hive beetles to move in and exploit those resources and make a mess of things. So... Uh, how long do honey cap frames last outside after being frozen to kill possible small hive beetle eggs and larvae? Thank you. How long do honey capped frames last outside after being frozen to kill the possible small? Well, once you've frozen them and killed the eggs and stuff, the only way that uh, they can have a problem again is if uh, they get reinfested. So the thing, how long do they last outside? So like in a storage shed or something like that, think in terms of what the temperature is already inside your beehive. So we know that interior beehive temperatures, 94, 97, up to 100 degrees. So you want to hold your frames at 105 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, I don't know Celsius for that right now. But 105 Fahrenheit is your upper limit for storing capped honey that you intend to further use. So, and temperatures below that, of course, are better, but those are considered high temperatures. Also, you can consider at 105 degrees Fahrenheit that the honey is not altered. In other words, the beneficial properties of raw honey are preserved at 105 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. So I hope that helps. And here's Super Adam 1313. Have you got an idea how long the flow frames last yet? I don't, they're five years old right now. I know they get grungy looking. And we evaluated the material condition of the flow frames, the wear surfaces and things like that, and they function perfectly. And this is interesting too. Those things are expensive, we all know that. So uh, the flow company, which is honeyflow.com. So if you have bought flow supers and flow frames and you find that they're not functioning correctly anymore, uh, last Tuesday, in fact, every Tuesday, the Flow Hive Company on their YouTube channel, which is Flow Hive, um, they do a live stream like we're doing right now. And he said, last Tuesday, contact them and they'll take care of you if you've got a problem with one of the frames, if it's degraded in any way. So we don't know the failing limit of those flow frames yet. So you can contact them and... Uh, They'll take care of it if you've got one that's failing. But as far as I know, they're fine so far. So that's pretty good stuff. And that's a really good backing, which it should be, considering they're over $60 a frame, by the way. Uh, Norseman Honey, good day, Fred. I had a good year with five hives. I left alone and only added supers. Ended up with a 1,000 pounds of honey, no treating or feeding. Let me tell you, that's awesome, by the way, but let me tell you what, I don't want a thousand pounds of honey to deal with. I'm a backyard beekeeper. That is a pile of honey, and that's very good results. And a lot of this has to do with where people live, the stock of the bees they keep, and the resources that are available. Location, location, location. If you want to know if where you're living or where you're thinking about keeping bees would be a good spot for bees to be kept, are the resources good enough? Get ready for this. So get your pen out. Beescape, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E dot -E -E org. And unfortunately, this is just for the United States. 
Um, you can look there and find out, uh, number one, are pesticides being used where you are? Is there great forage for your bees? What time of year would be the dearth? So you can decide early on, man, is this a good place to keep bees or not? Just so happens where I live, and I don't want this broadcast because I don't want everybody to bring their bees here. Because, you know, I hate people just in general. But um, the resources are, there's no dearth here. There's also lots of space for bees if they get away from you. You get a swarm that takes off. There's lots of natural resources, trees, cavities, things like that, based on reports there. And I'm in a pesticide, very low pesticide zone. So it's like a 40 here. And the higher the number, the worse it is. And I have another satellite apiary, 15-minute drive to the north here. And the pesticide low there is 240 because of all the um, grape growers up there. So that's interesting. Let me just jump in and see if I can grab one here. Have you ever used your FLIR to find feral colonies? And what's the ticket cost for the for caimans? I don't know what it costs like caimans gathering, you mean? The cost for the Hive Life Conference? I think it's $200 or something. I don't know. Don't quote me. You're going to have to go there uh, to the website to find out what the costs are. But the FLIR, by the way, finding feral colonies, and this year was fantastic for that, by the way. Hate to be overly excited, but there's a lot of bee trees out there. And they're many miles from me, so I know these are not my bees. And I've been invited to come as often as I want to see the bee trees, and thermally, they don't show up. That's because the trees are so big and so thick, and the entrance is in the bottom third of the cavity, and I used an endoscope to get inside and look at the cavity to see how the bees were situated. I don't get an external heat signature from that. Now, probably if I went back in the middle of winter, I would see a heat signature just through the hole itself, but nothing through you know, the walls of the bees, which are six inches thick or more on average. So I can't, the thermal camera is kind of useless for finding them, but we know where they are. So now we can get in there and see what they do through the winter. And uh, you are welcome, Chili's Bees. And what else do we do? What can I do if I find out there is not enough brood when the hive goes to winter? Do I join colonies together? Or what can I do to get them to winter without dying? Here's the problem. We need some brood. We need some refreshment of the bee numbers inside the hive. So if you've got multiple hives and you've got a weak colony that definitely does not have enough brood, and therefore they're just gonna dwindle away through winter. You could combine those colonies and use that paper method. You put newsprint on the strongest colony, you put your weaker colony on top of it, you cut slats in the newsprint and you let them blend together. And uh, the other thing then though, is you're gonna wanna feed that colony. So we're combining, it's here's the toss up, right? They have a good colony that's doing really well and they're strong and they're gonna go through winter and they have lots of resources stored. You have another colony over here that's not doing well, low brood, not a lot of resources. They look like they might not make it through winter. When you combine the resources, you also bring on board bees that require more resources now. So this is the judgment call. Keep the strong colony by itself because we know they're going to make it. Leave this other colony on their own to finish out their normal lives without replenishing their brood. They may not have a good queen, something like that and then just let them live out their lives and keep feed on them just to make them happy until the end. Because this time of year, it's hard to combine colonies. The other thing is you're interfering with an established colony that probably has plenty of wax, I mean, wax, but plenty of honey stored going into winter. Judgment call, it's kind of how valuable is the colony that's in decline. Took up beekeeping this year, two nukes, and my bees did really well. Should I assume they will make it through winter or buy another nuke as insurance? So that's, and that's a good question. That's Chili's bees. We have no guarantees that your bees are going to make it through winter. And I don't know where you live, but we all think our bees are doing fantastic. We get super hopeful this time of year because the colonies are full. They're booming. They're bustling. Everything is in there. They have all their resources. And then February and March comes along and we find out that they're dead, dead just out of the blue. So here's what I recommend. New beekeepers, especially. New beekeepers tend to bail out on beekeeping. 80% of new beekeepers in the United States quit beekeeping in their second year. Usually that's because come spring, they've lost all their colonies and they just don't have the heart to keep going. They spent a lot of money and ended up with nothing. 
The other thing is, uh, with spring coming up, if you are in any way concerned that you might be without bees in spring, or you already know in advance that you want to expand a little bit, this is the time of year to order your nucleus colony, to be in touch with people that are selling, taking orders for nucleus colonies. Of course, your best sources are local to you within driving distance. If you don't have bees available where you live and you know you're going to need them through the mail or something like that, remember last spring we had a disaster with packaged bees going through the mail. Um, then you need to put your orders in in advance so that you're not disappointed. So you need to pay for them in advance and, of course, have uh, hives and stuff available. Uh, Nita wrote here, I think the Hive Life Conference tickets are $180 a person. Thank you for that, Anita. And uh, yeah, they, it's, it's easy to find out about if you Google Hive Life Conference. It's in Tennessee. It's in January. And they have a whole list of like motels that are available and everything else. I'm staying at the motel, which is attached to the conference center. So all I have to do is walk in there. So, Fred, you have cold winters like we do in Nebraska. Do you wrap all of your hives? Nope, I don't wrap any of my hives. I insulate the covers and uh, put feeder shims on them. And that stays that way, by the way, all year round. So it's not a winter prep. So in the future, when people say, what are your winter preps? My winter preparations are simply to remove surplus uh, boxes from the hives until they're scaled down to two or three boxes only going into winter. And this winter, we even have boxes. We have hives that are going through single deeps. And the only insulation that's on there is the insulated inner cover. And then the feeder shim, insulated outer cover, and I don't wrap them or do anything else. And here's another thing, by the way. Uh, for those of you who do oxalic acid um, vaporization, what's that good for? Well, it shows you where you might have leaks in your hive. Also, we'll show where you have leaks in your respirator, too, by the way, if you sniff some of that stuff in. But... When you're vaporizing, look at all three sides of, you know, four sides, sorry, four sides of your hive and uh, see if the vapor is coming out because that would indicate that your bees did not propolize that area and didn't seal it up. So you're going to have uh, old man winter is going to blow right into that opening. So it's a great way to see if you've got leaks and then take care of those going into winter because we don't want that. So anyway. Brooklyn's honeybees. I don't suppose you or anyone in the stream have any idea if flow. If Flow plan on bringing back the National Hive Flow Super. I tried speaking with the guys, but they haven't got back to me. Okay, so the National Hives, if correct me if I'm wrong, but those are basically square hives. I know that people uh, make their own woodwork. And when you look at these frames, by the way, because this is built around the, the Langstroth deep frame. So the Langstroth deep box is what they go in, right? So what you can do at your own risk, by the way, you better like puzzles. You take this stainless steel cord off and you can do that. It better not happen right here, but you can flex it and flip out all the pieces. And then what you do is you remove the leaves that get this down to the size that you need it to be. And of course, then you use your wire and you fix that back up and keep it back together and put it back in there. So what you're doing is you're probably gonna to have to do your own wooden work. Uh, Flow Hive is not good at making alternate box choices. In fact, they don't even make a medium super, by the way. And for those of you who want to know how to get a Flow Hive medium super, you get the deep. So let me explain why I did that. I got a bunch of deep boxes and I got the cedar versions. And uh, they're the seven frame super size, which is the 10 frame Langstroth matchup. But those of you who have Langstroth standard gear and then these flow boxes, they're off by a quarter inch in width. So the flows are a little narrower. So you can buy one of their boxes, put it all together, glue it up. Don't use any screws, don't use any nails. Just glue, clamp it, square it up. Then put it on your table saw, or if you're super handy and super skilled and have steady hands, you can probably use a hand saw and do this. But you're going to cut that box, save the top that's got, of course, the rabbit cut in it, which supports your frames. Cut that box off as a medium super depth, right? Then you end up with a piece at the bottom that you take off. Now you have a feeder shim that you can put 
fondant and things like that in. So that would go up on top of your top box underneath the nice gabled roof that they have. And then you have a space to put a feeder, uh, fondant, dry food, things like that. So it's a win-win, get the deep box, make your own medium, and then get your feeder shim out of one deep box. That's what I'm doing for kicks. But they're not good at providing uh, unique style boxes. I don't think this, the national Hive, the National Standard Hive is something that they're going to offer, but I don't speak for them. So you can ask, but as you said, they're not answering that question. So I think they're sticking with Langstroth uh, dimensions. Uh, so what else do we have? Gizzy's mom. We had a bad flood in the past summer that wetted many hives. What tips do you have? to best deal with this kind of event. So here's the thing, this falls with location, location, and location. All of my hives, you, you wanna try to get your hives. I realize because even when I lived in South Carolina, Charleston County, uh, they had, uh, it's, the, it's the low country, everything's flat. So putting your hives up on stands uh, helps you with a lot of things. One, it keeps the pests away from them and uh, helps your hives in a lot of ways, less bending over, and unless you're one of those people that builds a seven, eight, nine box hive uh, tall stack, I don't. But uh, that also, by putting them on iron t posts that are driven into the ground, and then you put steel conduit that your boxes sit on, water could rush right under that and not move a darn thing. The other thing is you don't want your boxes close to the ground to begin with. It puts them, you, you want them to be ventilated underneath. And we don't want pests to be able to crawl right up out of the ground, right into your hives. So it always troubles me when I see beehives that are set right on the ground, right on pavers and things like that. Uh, they really are right, you know, in the feeding zone for ants and everything else. So raise your equipment up. Uh, Jesse Blair says, is it okay to wrap hives? Yeah, it's okay. In fact, if I were just wrapping a hive to break the wind, you know what I would use? Tyvek. Uh, it's a house wrap, and uh, Tyvek is one of the few house wraps, by the way. You can get it from Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever. Uh, it wicks moisture out and does not let moisture in. And it has a limited, you know, use. Like it would be good for one winter and you're done. One of the reasons I don't wrap hives, you know, with uh, core flute and things like that, or even big insulation pieces, I don't wrap them. You have to have a storage area for that stuff. I suppose if you're going to leave it on all year round, uh, I don't like it. Now, here's where, let me take a drink of hot chocolate for this because I'm about to probably get people upset. This is why I don't insulate my hives. <clears throat> so I'll explain my philosophy behind that. Insulated hives do well. So if you want to wrap them, uh, but remember, we want to make sure that air doesn't flow through your hives and leak the resources out, that the bees are warming the air and everything else. And yes, I know, honeybees don't heat the interior of the hive. They heat the cluster. There's secondary heat from that cluster that rises up inside the hive. If there's a vent in the top, that heat that they're accumulating up inside the hive, passive heat, vents out. What happens when that warm air vents out? Cold air comes in and vents through too. You just took away your honeybees control over airflow through the hive. This is why, aside from Dr. Seeley's excellent research, this is why I don't have upper vents and I don't have upper entrances. So now we'll move from that point on. Here's the next thing. We talked about temperatures in wintertime when your bees can forage, right? So, and you'll make this observation yourself and this can be repeated. Another reason why you should join a beekeeper fellowship because you get to bounce off. This person insulates, this person doesn't. This person has hives in the shade. This person has hives in the sun. This person's hives face south. This one faces north and they're all right. Everybody has got the perfect solution down. So I'm just sharing my method. I'm not saying it's the perfect one, but insulated hive, uninsulated hive, winter time. We get an early morning where it rises from 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Next thing you know, it's 55 degrees Fahrenheit and the sun is low in the south and it hits the landing boards, which are facing south. South by southeast facing landing boards are beneficial. I'm about to explain why. Then the sun hits both hives equally. Insulated hive, uninsulated hive. Uninsulated hive, foragers are active on the landing board right away and they're zipping out and they're doing cleansing flights already. Insulated hives hits here. Same exposure, same entrance size, same landing board, same configuration other than insulation. 
they're not going anywhere. They don't perceive that it's warm yet. Meanwhile, they'll start to come out by two or three in the afternoon, and then it's already starting to get colder again or a snowstorm or something comes in. Meanwhile, this colony without insulation has done its foraging flights. They're getting water for melting snow and things like that, and they're already getting that back inside the hive. So for me, where I live, see, these things can be different, different elevations, different, you know, weather patterns and things like that. I'm in a heavy weather, heavy snow area, not extremely cold like some of the Canadian people, for example. It'd be rare for us to get, you know, 12, 13 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period of time. So what happens is hives in the sun, uninsulated, get active sooner, get resources faster, get back to the hive better than those that are insulated. Now, the trade-off, let me argue with myself right now. Well, Fred, that's wrong because that insulated hive, they didn't have to forage because they're already warm and they don't need as many resources to stay warm. That's true. Now, but my uninsulated hive, the interior walls, they have condensation on them below the cluster where it doesn't hurt them. Now they have water inside too. The insulated hive didn't have that dew point established until much lower. So now these guys are getting water from outside, from inside, from all over. So who's right? But now let's move it forward. Now we're in February, now we're in March. Cold mornings, right? So whose hive is gonna build up faster? The insulated hive, uninsulated hive. My uninsulated hive, they're foraging sooner. They got the warmth quicker, the box heated up. So I was like, ooh, who's getting the pollen now? The uninsulated hive, who's gonna build brood faster? The uninsulated hive, the insulated hive isn't kicking out the door and doing their thing until mid afternoon. Two o'clock to three o'clock is their prime foraging, getting those things, so like Salix discolor, you know, the willow trees that are putting out all that sweet pollen, they're getting beat out by the uninsulated hive. So is one worse than the other? Eh, not necessarily. It's just that one isn't insulated. Now, the other thing is I can't do thermals on my insulated hive because I read surface temperature and I can only look at the entrance. Uninsulated hive, I know exactly where they are and so on. And I don't have to store a bunch of insulation. And the uninsulated hives look better. It's aesthetics. They just look better. So does that help? <laughs> I just talked to myself for about 15 minutes there. Fred, would it be wise to treat with oxalic acid now and then again in a couple of weeks to possibly get mites you missed the first time? Okay, so for oxalic acid vaporization, you don't have to open the hive, so you don't disrupt anything, but here's what we need to be going on inside there. We need them to loosen their cluster. We know that bees start to form a loose cluster anytime it's in the low 60s, 62, 61, and so on. So they have a loose cluster. So I would say if you get one of those weird days where it hits 60 degrees and up, you're going to have a loose cluster inside. Yes, you can hit them with your oxalic acid vaporization because you didn't have to open the hive to do it or anything else. And they're going to be at a time when they have the smallest brood of the year, end of November, where I live, beginning of December. Hit them with that. You, get, you take out over 90% of the mice in a single treatment. Definitely. I would do it. So, but if it stays cold, you know, if you're down in the 40s and stuff, very little efficacy. So that's a lot of effort for very little gain. But again, the argument is you wouldn't hurt them. You're just kind of wasting your time as you won't get at all the surfaces because who are the targets inside the cluster? Which bees? We need to get the nurse bees and we need to get those that are on the, where the brood will be and where the brood is the smallest. Plus we have those fat bodied winter bees. If there's any mites, they're going to be right in there inside the cluster. So if the cluster's tight, the oxalis doesn't get to them. So that's that's the target group that we need to get why the cluster needs to be broken. Here's Matt. Fred, would you be able to share your thoughts on two or three frame starter hive mating nucleus? I don't believe you use this method, but why knowing you're also interested in increasing your numbers? Okay, I'm not trying to increase my numbers. But nucleus colonies, two or three frames, is a great way to start. Super Adam just bought me coffee. That is the best. Thank you very much, Super Adam 1313. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. 
But I do like nucleus colonies. Here's what I do because springtime comes. And I talked about this the last time. We need nucleus hives ready to go with frames in them. And uh, what I do is when I get a colony that's an overachiever coming out of spring, like last spring, we had these colonies exploding out the wazoo. So I look in them, we see that the numbers are building up and they're at risk of swarming. So rather than let them swarm, I'm going to go ahead and pull frames of brood with eggs and I'm going to just put those in there. It's called a walkaway split. I put them right in the five frame nucleus box, those pine boxes that I talked about before that I got from Better Bee. And then I turned around and bought a whole bunch more of those. So I'm actually going to do that more as insurance for my other colonies. And they all did extremely well. And I didn't feed them. I just provided them with a small box at a time when the nectar was flowing, where the drones were flying, and they made their own queens, and everything was perfect. So I am a fan of three-frame starter nucleus colonies as a way to control swarming in some of your bigger colonies. And to start a resource, they'll raise their own queen. Then they'll start production. And then also you can use them when you put that second layer on they become a source for surplus comb and surplus capped honey for colonies that are lagging behind in your apiary. Otherwise, it's it's all right there. You just walk around and help yourself to whatever you need. And sure, they get mad. Sure, you took their babies away. Sure, you took their hard-earned resources out of the hive. But what you did is you kept them small so that you can keep the resource there. And you have a queen if you need one. If you need them to make another one, you take the queen they have away and you leave them with eggs and they make another queen. And if they don't, then you pull from one of the other nucleus colonies next to them and you put more eggs in and give them another try. Or you find a queen cell over here. You take the queen cell out because you don't want them to swarm. And you put the queen cell in a box over here with a bunch of brood. So you get nurse bees. That queen hatches. She flies out. She mates with an awesome drone at the drone congregation area. Comes back. And there you go. Insurance. Did I talk too fast? I get carried away sometimes. Uh, what else are we looking at? Bill Meeks. Bill Meeks, by the way, is my best friend from high school. That's right. Kirkwood High School. Go Pioneers. St. Louis County, Missouri. Glad to see you, Bill. Uh, we will never change some people's minds. You just can't. We don't have to change people's minds, by the way. That's one of the fun parts of beekeeping. Uh, we share what we're all doing. Uh, we enjoy each other's stories. Uh, somebody talks about something that succeeded that worked really well and somebody else that everybody said that was never going to work. All of a sudden spring comes and they have 100% survival and everybody sits around and goes, what did you do that you're not telling us about? So we don't always have to change minds, but we can definitely benefit from finding out what works and getting our information from people that are really being honest about how they're keeping their bees and what their results are. So Casey says, I'm broke. I hate me. I'm kidding. Okay, all right. So anyway, Dan C, I have an anxiety problem with having bees in my suit around my head. I've been, I've been stung over and over on open tractors by yellow jackets, and the sudden buzzing around my head makes me panic and run away. Dan, stand your ground. Always have a veil with you, by the way. And this is something, too. Oh, I meant to add this, by the way. In your bee shed where you keep all your gear and where your emergency bee suits are and stuff like that, your smokers, everything's ready to go. Ready to go. That's key. You shouldn't be hunting for anything. Have a mirror on the wall. I don't care if it's one of those stainless steel reflective surfaces, whatever it is, polished stainless. You need to, when you put your bee suit on uh, and you're working alone, look in the mirror and make sure everything is zipped up tight. How many times have you walked out in the bee yard and you're all suited up in a full bee suit or your bee jacket or whatever, and you forgot to zip your veil? It's just open. Next thing you know, there's a bee and it's so close to your face, you're not sure, is that inside my veil or is it outside? And next thing you know, you feel it crawling around your ear. Okay, it's inside. Have a mirror, check your veil, just like divers. Before they enter the water, they check their buddy. Everybody checks each other's equipment before you leave the surface. Do it for a beekeeper too. Have a mirror. Check your stuff. Nothing is worse. Well, there's a lot of things that are worse, actually, but it's not a good feeling to know that the bees are in your bonnet at all. And uh, what else do we have? Oh, yeah, wait. Okay. 
broke, Dan C, have an anxiety. So anxiety is defeated by knowledge, confidence training. So be ready. Know what you're dealing with, what drives them. Calvin says, is it a good idea to put brood minders in all my hives? Well, I don't know. They cost money. And Broodminder has a variety of different things. The cheapest thing Broodminder offers, this is not an advertisement for them. I just happen to have this here. This is a temperature sensor. It goes in your hive, this side up, battery up. This little number sticks out of the front of your hive, right? So you put this in your top box. They just give you information. And that number corresponds, you put the app on your phone and you go around and you can see what the temperature fluctuations on there and you know which of your hives are the warmest, which ones have brood in them early, which ones have the bigger numbers. So it's a judgment thing whether or not you really need to have um, brood minder equipment or not. I will say this because I got questions as recent as this morning about the brood minder scales. I don't own any of them. What we do is we have people in my beekeeping group in the Beekeepers Association that are very outspoken about those broodminder scales. They appear to be inconsistent and uh, not providing really usable data. So consider what these things are going to cost, what you're going to do with the information, and then um, go from there, whether there's value in having them in every hive, or you could just put them in your strongest colonies, your weakest colonies, and assume that those colonies that are intermediate to that are going to kind of be in alignment if you had a whole bunch of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Uh, let's see. I'm going to treat tomorrow. Good. 61 degrees. Yeah. Northern Colorado. Nancy, dress in a full suit and gloves and have figured out how to do most things, including, but the mirror is a good idea. I know because, because it's my idea. So it's, you know, it's good. You, if I came up with that idea, okay. Uh, hey, Super Adam, spot me five and hit old dad. Okay, let's move on. Two, two, two. How early in spring can I make splits? How early in spring are your bees overpopulating their hives? That's what dictates when you're going to make splits. And it catches people off guard. It didn't catch me off guard this year because I was ready for them. Way earlier than you would think that their numbers are building. That's why they catch people off guard year after year and swarm out. Your goal in making splits is to keep them from swarming out and increase your apiary. So that's what I like to do. But uh, it's really dictated by, you know, because we can't predict the spring ahead of time. We don't know what the weather's going to be. We don't know what the resources are going to be. And we don't know how the bees are going to respond. And it can seem like they're doing absolutely nothing in their hives. And it can seem like it's so cold that uh, they can't possibly be building big numbers of brood in there. My problem was they put those insulated covers on all the hives last year and they used less than half of what they normally use in stored honey and they came through winter and they came out strong and then I had to be ready for them to do splits or to super the boxes. So instead of supering, I split them. I got them. I lost like two swarms last year, which is a miracle for me uh, that I didn't actually get back right away. So it's really regional and you just got to keep an eye on your bees and see what's going on. If you can do thermals, and by the way, those who have the super insulated hives don't know how big their hives are growing. The ones with the insulated hives that are just well sealed up, use a thermal camera and I can see the heat signature growing inside the hive. And I know that's a hive I have to open and split. So there's another one, see? So there's, it's, you know, there's, there's benefits and, and drawdowns to everything kind of. Let's see, Darren, UK, I'm sure I read mites hate the herb thyme plant. Is this true? Thyme all. In fact, it's true. Uh, there's a girl, a high school girl that everybody was really talking about a couple of years ago. She was going to uh, University of Connecticut, Yukon Huskies, and she got a scholarship and she got thousands of hives in her test study group. And she had a time all it's called entrance that would give them a dose on their way in and out and it was to uh, get bromides under control it was supposed to be the next big thing huge studies were going on and they gave concessions and permission for her to use it in an unestablished approved way as a miticide and we just haven't heard any follow-up yet so if somebody knows anything about that study at UConn 
and can put us a link down in the video description, not the description, but in the comment section below this video after we close out. I would love to catch up and find out what's going on with her research because she was like being celebrated as a young bee genius and she got all this funding and support. So yes, people say that it can have an impact on varroa destructor mites. I don't know the great details about uh, how Tymol is working on them, but it is known to do that. Uh, let's see, Casey Dooley, you made me immortal. Thank you for being the best instructor with the ability to prove everything you research. Thank you, Casey. I try to prove stuff. That's good. I appreciate it. Diane Farina, are grease patties a good idea for feeding now? Can you mix in spirulina? I don't feed grease patties ever. Grease patties come up uh, generally because people are concerned about trachea mites. Trachea mites are way down the totem pole. They used to be a huge problem, and it was the bees' way of masking their odor so that the trachea mites wouldn't get into their, for lack of a better term, their vents, which are near their, the largest ventricular or next to their wing muscles. And so these trachea mites, these disgusting trachea mites, get in through these holes, and they follow the scent. And then, of course, they reproduce in the trachea of the bee, and they choke off their air circulation. So actually, so it's not a big enough deal right now. So I would not be feeding grease patties personally, unless you have a, a way of proving that this is an issue that your bees are facing. I just wouldn't put it in there. So Adam Holmes, I have broodminder scale. It seems to read accurately, but I have major issues getting the data. So for Adam, my question is, if you've contacted uh, the broodminder people, are they responsive and do they give you good information and help you troubleshoot that stuff? Because again, the broodminder scales are expensive, you guys. Um, so you really have to weigh the benefit. See, see what I did right there? Weigh the benefit of having the scale. Because you know, your, your beehives tip forward, tip backwards, you know, there's some calculus going on here. You support the hive at this point, and you support the hive at the front at this point, and of course the weight is measured only here. So how is the weight distributed in the hive? Is it a live load? Is it moving forward? Is it moving back? Are the bees static and level? You know, kind of like buoyancy and stability on a ship that's got communicating water and things like that. It's hard to determine buoyancy and stability. You kind of have the problem with the broodminder scales, not knowing, because remember your weight in a beehive is not centered. It's not necessarily a static, predictable position within the hive because sometimes they load their honey and everything to the sunrise side or to the front of the hive where it's warmer in the wintertime. And so, and the bees mass, the bulk of bees, remember bees weigh several pounds and they can move forward or back or up or down. Of course, there's a fulcrum aspect, see? So Adam Holmes, super sharp guy, I'm sure he's worried about what's called a dynamic load within the hive. Therefore, a hive scale that sits on one measured bar, and then, you know, you're assuming there's some static aspect to the load within the hive. So let's see. Mark Bidwell says, Fred, explain better B nine frame slatted rack. Better B makes a nine frame slatted rack? I didn't know that. Better Bee sells slatted racks. Oh, look, I just happen to have one here. Sorry about the noise. Look at all the comb, by the way, built underneath the slatted rack. It's all drone comb, by the way. This is a slatted rack. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight frame slatted rack. This is from, um, I think this is the Better Bee one. This is a Better Bee slatted rack. They sell the eight or the 10 frame slatted rack. I didn't know they had a nine frame. Um, but what it does is gives you space off the bottom board. That solid front piece here, this goes towards the front. So it would be like this. You've got this big space underneath. So the bees would be entering the hive here and then rising up between here. And these are aligned with the frames that are hanging on your deep box. And this cuts down on the wind buffeting coming in and also makes the entrance darker from above. Therefore, your queen is, in theory, 
going to lay further down on the deep frames just above this than she would if this were missing and the bottom of the frames were just near the entrance, the, the queen tends to not lay eggs and the bees tend to not produce um, cells all the way down to the bottom of the frame, where with the slider rack they do. It's supposed to give them additional space for the workers to hide. Here's one of the things I like about it. If you're dumping a swarm of bees inside a deep box and there's a slatted rack on it, you have all the space underneath. When you dump the bees in, they all go to the bottom right away and you can put all your frames right in right away. It has a utility use. The other thing is, and the reason that I have that one because it's got the comb underneath. It provides a space to keep your bees away from if you're putting in oxalic acid in one of the pans. It keeps the pan away from the actual brood, so you're not like burning bees. Sometimes when people put in a pan and ignite the oxalic acid and sublimate it, they pull it back out and there's a bunch of dead bees on it. So, and the other concern is that it would catch fire. That's why I show people that one, because you want to do a dry run and stick your pan in as far as it's going to go and make sure it's not interacting with beeswax. We don't want to set the hive on fire. So it has some utility to it, extra space. Queen will use, the workers will build cells further down, and then the queen will lay eggs further down, and uh, buffeting, winter, darker, those are the attributes that I can think of right now. So, Dan C, the miticide might not work fast enough, though, so the mite drop later after the bee is done foraging. Harold says, you pull the queen excluder going into winter. Absolutely. Do not have any queen excluders in any of your hives going into winter. The last thing you want your bees to do is move up through that queen excluder to where the resources are high in the hive in winter, leaving the queen behind, and then she dies. But here's what happens. A bunch of the bees, of course, would stay with the queen when she can't move up, and they starve in place, and you've got a cluster of bees with a dead queen in the middle, and they're all dead. Always remove your queen excluder for winter. Uh, what else? Do, 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 do. Oh, they he says, Yep, they do sell a nine frame slatted rack. That is weird. So I don't know what to say about it because it doesn't match up. Unless you had, okay, I could see it. Some people do space out their brood frames. Uh, instead of having 10 in there, they'll take one out and make them all equidistant. That's the only thing I can think of. I don't personally do that. It's the only thing I can think of that they would do. So they would have a nine frame slatted rack. I don't think it will make a difference one way or the other if those slats are lined up with your frames or not. Because the function would remain the same. And if it if they're coming up through the slats in the slatted rack and they have to jog over and then go up between the frames above that, I don't even see that as a problem or slowing things down at all. Uh, let's see, John stats, would a person insulate just the north side of a hive for the best of both worlds, warm the coldest side and still be able to thermal image? That's very clever. And actually I've seen that a lot. They haven't insulated just the north side, but I see people insulate three sides. So leaving the south facing side, which is where the landing board is, it's where they, done, they do the best overall. That's all I'm saying. If you've got north... I've got hives that face every direction, and that's how I can make these observations. It's shaped like a horseshoe. North, east, south, and west, they all face different directions. But uh, yeah, people do insulate three sides, and that southern side in the wintertime, because that gets the low sun, the heat right there. Uh, I've seen that a lot. So I don't know if it, I haven't done that test myself to see if that keeps them foraging early and keeping up with the others that are uninsulated or what the consumption of resources has been. Um, but that could still work. Anthony says, you still recommend pre-waxing flow hives prior to installation. I have never pre-waxed a flow hive flow frame before ins installation ever. I've never done it. I know that the owner, the inventor, Cedar Anderson recommends sometimes that people smear a little honeycomb on there to get them up there working, but I've never pre-treated any of my flow supers, any of my flow frames from the beginning, and they've all used them. So at one colony the very first year, they didn't do anything with the flow super and I moved it onto a stronger colony and they took off like gangbusters. Uh, what else do we have? 
I would like to urge everyone to watch Randy Oliver's latest video on Varroa treatment. He possibly has some game-changing methods on OA treatments. He spoke at the New York Wellness Bee Association, and that's from one shoe. Okay, you know, I'm really glad somebody brought up Randy Oliver's discussion about his uh, oxalic acid vaporization treatments or his uh, Varroa treatment overall, because he doesn't just test oxalic acid. He has other methods, but he's fixated on sponges right now. But here's the thing that I want to share with people that listen to me and follow my channel. Um, be aware that when Randy Oliver and some other researchers are doing their studies, that they're always doing this with a special permit to do those studies. So in other words, he's doing research, so later we have a hope that it's going to, if it's successful, if it does everything it's supposed to do with little side effects on you know, your queen fertility and all of these other things that play, uh, extended release oxalic acid with glycerin. Uh, that's not approved for us. Randy is doing it under special permission and he has a permit. And when he gives his talks, and we're going to be talking to Randy early next year, when he gives his talks, he's very clear that what he's doing is not approved yet. So a lot of backyard beekeepers, I mean, nobody's watching what you're doing, right? So it's just a matter of ethics, really. Uh, we see that something, we see his numbers, the numbers look good. Keep in mind, region, location, humidity, temperature ranges, all of these things play in what's going to work in the Varroa Destructor Mite Controls in your own apiary, including the integrated pest management practices that you include in what you do with your bees. So when Randy's doing studies in Colorado and in all these high uh, elevation areas where they can get their apiary out and away, the results may not be the same. This is why they have to go through an approval process. Uh, so don't just, it is great to look and learn and pay attention to Randy. And it's called scientificbeekeeping.com. You can go there and see all the research he does. Randy is great at updating old research and giving you links and things like that. Uh, but the tendency is to, oh, that's going to work. I can buy that. I can get all that stuff. I can get those sponges and I can cut them all up and I can put them in in the square uh, inches of sponge surface area that needs to be there. And I know the saturation rate and I know that I can add the oxalis and all that stuff and it's going to work. And now I'm going to get this extended release and it's going to kill off all the mites. You can't legally do that. So does that mean people won't do it? Oh, yeah, people do it all the time. I mean, every... Every new thing that Randy works on, some people get their notes out and they write down everything that he's using and they put that to use in their hive right there and sometimes without the same results. So this is why we wait and that's why we have a scientific method because we have to run through a full cycle with it. And then of course, getting, you know, getting things approved later and they really have to be peer reviewed uh, the tests have to be repeated. Early on, he did his studies with uh, shop towels. Again, glycerin, extended release method. The bees chew up the towels, get them out of the hive. And then another study launched, and Bob Binney's bees were actually used in part of that study. And that university study uh, concluded that it was not effective, that it did not work. So the results were in contrast with what Randy had done. So always wait and see what pans out in the end. And of course, wait for things to be approved before you go ahead and jump on uh, doing that to your own bees. Because the question is, you know, everybody wants the, the silver bullet to deal with the, the Varroa destructor mite because we all hate those mites. You know, we would do anything to get rid of them. But in the meantime, work with what's approved, use integrated pest management, keep your colonies healthy and strong, and work with a good stock of bees Keep their nutrition up because here's another thing that I hope people pay attention to when An uh, when Randy Oliver talks about this stuff. And I'm so glad he's back in the game right now, by the way. He's healed well and he's doing good. Uh, some hives, keep in mind, when he has colonies that he does these studies on, he has to get colonies that in the spring are heavily mite loaded so that he can have a reduction in mites, of course. And the questions come up. Well, that colony in spring was so loaded with mites. Why didn't they all die out through the winter time? And he will admit that that's a puzzle. So part of this too is the stock of bees that you keep 
And we can start to look at uh, Dr. Seeley. We can look at some of Leo Sherishkin. I see Leo Sherishkin as Dr. Leo is way off in the hands off too much. And Dr. Seeley keeps everything very small and a lot of swarming. So that's part of integrated pest management because they're swarming, they have brood breaks and things like that. But what's happening is some of these bees are surviving with what's determined to be a non-survivable mite load. So now we have a stock of bees that's healthy enough that even though they're affected by the pathogens that the mice are that the mice that the mites are carrying with them, they're not expiring from that exposure. So for me personally, the long game is bees that can handle it. And we can't do that as backyard beekeepers. We can't come up with our own genetic line because our bees are constantly interacting with other beehives and apiaries, you know, within a mile of our own homes. So for us to have a meaningful breeding operation is very challenging. So instead we invest in and support those who are capable of doing genetic studies and research and everything. And Randy, if you know, uh, he has mut mutts, by the way. So he's raising bees that have queens that do fantastic um, survival on their own untreated with mites. He has those bees too. His problem is they're not breeding true. So he's not getting progeny from those bees that are capable of fighting, fighting off mites on their own. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff going on that, that also contributes to the success of a study. And that's why we kind of have to let things pan out before we do stuff, but definitely watch, see what his studies are, see what his presentations are. He's got a lot of fantastic information out there. So uh, lots of good stuff. What else do we have? By the way, we're just about done here today. Uh, let's see. To be fair, oxalic acid strips are legal and off the shelf in New Zealand. Okay, so that's New Zealand. We can't Oxalic acid wasn't even legal to use as a miticide in the United States while it was being used in Europe. So there, I'm, I'm speaking, when I say that, I'm speaking about the United States and the way they determine what's legal and usable in your hives. Other nations, other areas, I'm completely clueless about what's permitted, what's allowed, what's legal. So I'm talking specifically about uh, getting something approved here in the United States and then using what's approved in the way it's approved to be used. So let's see what else. Study being done on slow release pads from South America. Praxolic acid, a producer wants to sell into North America. See, Fred Hunkler says that again, they can't sell these pads and treatments into the United States and get approval until it's approved. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Uh, legal off the shelf, New Zealand. What else are we doing? Vaccine got stung five times in my face on the cheeks and jaw. After that, three of my not too best teeth became infected. Five weeks again, later again, answers. That's a physician territory right there. A reaction to the proteins in a honeybee's venom. Uh, always, I always defer uh, people with questions like that to your physician. We can't give medical advice. Is it silly or a good idea to split a three deep hive in a hive house that was a former ice house? I ran out of time to do it outside, but it's packed full of bees. I would wait until spring on them because we're in a time when they're going to be in reduction instead of production. And I would just, now that they're packed away, I wouldn't do the split inside. I would just, because we're also, whenever we do splits and manipulate them in the off season when it's cold, we're also breaking the propolis seals and everything else that they work so hard to establish. Me personally, somebody else may have a different idea. I would leave them intact until spring and just monitor them and make sure they have enough feed and resources. So as the rapid round won't fit in a five frame, how do you winter feed your nukes? if you feed dry sugar. Okay, this is what we're talking about. This is from MNL Farm. So the nucleus colony is only five frames. Here's a little yellow rapid round right here. But you do need a feeder shim on there. And one of the things you can do is called the mountain camp method. So if you've got a five frame nucleus colony, and this is why 
Where I live, the migratory cover by itself isn't good enough to get them through winter. We need a real cover, a telescoping cover, and we also need a feeder shim above them so you can put that in there because there isn't room. You know, when you get to the back of those frames and then the migratory cover is right there, there's no space to put any kind of resource over that. So we need a feeder shim on there. Uh, so for your nucleus colonies, and I recommend a sheet of newsprint without the newsprint. You can get newsprint, it's cheap. Without the newsprint, cut little slits in it, put your dry sugar in there, and you need a feeder spacer around. So a two inch is a good size. And then you spritz that with water when you set that down and the bees will chew up through it. They'll remove the paper, they'll consume the sugar and it's a good emergency feed through winter. And mine of course have five frames of capped honey above the five frame nucleus area for those bees. So it's, you have to scale it for what your size of the colony is. The good news is a nucleus colony is small and you can have a small feeder shim on there. And I have to recommend, you could put hive alive on there. Because this thing, look at it, this would fold right over. So you can even cut this in half and put one on each of your nucleus colonies right on the back of the frames. But there again, there's not enough room under that uh, migratory cover, so you know, telescoping cover. Or if you have an inner cover on that, this can sit on the inner cover and then your telescoping cover goes over the top of that. All of mine are super insulated this year, so we're going to see how that goes. First winter test for nuclear, nuclear nucleus colonies for me this is the first year going into winter with them so i've never done that in the past i've always put them in a eight frame deep or a 10 frame deep so what i'm going to say now is okay let me just look at one last one and make sure i'm not missing something you can use hive live fondant yes mark bidwell you sure can and uh and by the way they're going to be there at that conference according to cayman reynolds I would, uh, if that stuff's on sale, because it's really heavy, because it probably costs a lot to ship, I would hit them up for the Hive Alive winter patties. Of course, I understand we're, by then it's mid-January, but you'll need them to keep your bees from starving in February and March. I would plan that ahead. I plan to get stuff from them. So what else are we doing? Does moss at the bottom of the hive hide the SHB? Thanks for the stream. I would never put moss or any detritus or any raw materials at the bottom of a beehive in what some people are calling a natural bottom. And they use it a lot with top bar hives and uh, long or horizontal hives, Langstroth and stuff. They hold too much moisture for me. So I like for that to be able to be dried out. I don't put anything in the bottom. Fred Hunkler, did you watch Bob Binney's videos from the University of Georgia in Athens regarding the oxalic acid research? No. Did they come up with something different? I know what is changing uh, for a lot of the oxalic acid applications uh, research people, uh, the periodicity, the application rate. So in other words, uh, the dose is the same, but because we're not allowed to manipulate dose either, remember. But what they don't lock us into is the frequency of application. So I know that Randy Oliver recently said, uh, four or five day increments for your oxalic acid uh, vaporization treatments. And they continue in rapid succession for up to like nine treatments or something, which is a lot. If you're not counting your mites and you don't know what the efficacy is, and if you don't know if you're if they still require treatment, that's the thing I find a lot of people just aren't doing. They're just treating without counting, counting mites after they knew that they have and other people have asked Randy things like, can I just treat all year long? Can I just keep treating? Uh, please don't. How will we know which of your colonies are doing well without the treatment if we're treating all of them and treating consistently and continually uh, just to make sure, almost as a prophylactic measure, that mites aren't getting a leg hold? Uh, so I didn't watch it, but uh, by the way, I get to talk to Mike or Bob Binney, sorry, uh, when we go to the conference. I'm looking forward to interviewing him. Mm -hmm. We're going to interview a lot of people, and I'm going to make some YouTubes on that. So it's going to be fun. You're welcome, Calvin. Thank you. And uh, Jerry Brown, I think the max strip time on Apivar is around 56 days if your winter is short or if you do the whole in and out super fast winter. Uh, let's see. Things from a Dutch man living in Latvia. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. 
And can you recommend any particular process such as wax dip to preserve your bee boxes? Sure can. And by the way, that's another thing that's going to be at the Hive Life Conference. I did those. Uh, the first dip cycle is usually paraffin. And that's because it can get it hotter. It doesn't catch fire, which is a good thing when you're dipping wood. But it seeps into all the open cells of the wood. And then they do a finishing dip series with 100% beeswax. There are some people doing that already, and I do have some of those hives, and they're doing fantastic. I can't do that myself because I'm not going to have a huge vat of beeswax to do that or the paraffin. And so Cayman Reynolds, another one who does that, so you can check in with him. Uh, the other thing I'm testing this year is Eco Wood. I don't know if you've ever looked that up, so write that down. Eco Wood, E-C-O, TAC, W-O-O-D. Uh, that is a mineral finish for your hives. And I put that on a lot of different hives and all different materials, pine, paloma wood, cedar, and uh, hoop pine as well from Australia. So I have all that out. It's going through a whole year of observation. And so far, the eco wood, the migratory covers on my nucleus colonies, which is what I used it on. In fact, this right here, see that beehive, how dark that is? That's eco wood on that. So for a lot of them, it seems to be working really well, but the eco wood is not preventing my boards from splitting if it's the cover. So it's working on the sides, the joints, the dovetails, all that stuff. It seems to be doing really well. It is not keeping them from cracking if they're flat and exposed to wood. Uh, Noel Carter, how did Ross Rounds go? Perfect, by the way. University of Guelph, Guelph, sorry, let me say that right, Guelph, was looking at a number of doses and intervals, but they also mentioned someone is also testing the pads from South America as well. Everybody is, and that's from Fred, um, everyone is looking at these pads. I think it's extended release. Oxalis is, looks like it's going to really hit the mark, and Randy Oliver, all of them are on board with it. Uh, I think University of Guelph, which who's in, they're in Canada. Um, I think they also did the shop towel methods too. So we're going to, we're going to learn a lot. People are looking at it because the oxalic acid is not showing that the, that the mites are developing immunity to it. It's also not showing that it's damaging to the queen's reproductive capabilities. So there are a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it. It looks really good so far. It really does. I would love to go out there and just put a bunch of, uh, you know, extended release pads out there in mind rather than do the oxalic acid treatment. Plus you can leave them in there and they tear apart the pads and get rid of it on their own. Uh, much like they do with Formic Pro when they take those apart and get rid of that stuff. So it just gets left in there and they clean it out. But uh, I'm not, you know, in on their, in on their studies. I only have, you know, 21 hives. So I just learn what they're doing and uh, will one day apply it once, once they get through all the wickets and decide what works best. Is 25 grams of oxalic in the 100 milliliter of grain alcohol through a propane fire a good idea for treating hives? I do not know about that. I did um, recently had questions. Your, other people are asking about that right now. This fire comes up a lot with alcohol in it. Um, it's not something I've tested. I did provide a copy of um, all of the testing that was done to approve oxalic acid. And in that, they described the approved methods for delivery of the oxalic acid. And foggers were not part of that, where you have to add, some people were adding mineral oil, and the other was alcohol. And uh, that's not listed in the methods that were tested and approved. So I'm in the dark on that. If somebody's using it and it's working and they've got approval to use it, then I would go to them. Uh, to get those answers uh, because I'm just using direct sublimation. It is going right from the crystal right to vapor. And for me, uh, that's the way to go. And if somebody were asking me what to do uh, to treat them, I would definitely recommend oxalic acid vaporization through one of the pans that are very inexpensive. They're like $30, $35. And if you don't mind what things cost, then you get something like the ProVap 110. Uh, which is what I use because you move through really fast. You deliver a bunch of oxalis into a bunch of different hives through a quarter inch hole and you don't uh, really disrupt the hives. 
So I like that a lot, but when it comes to, I'm in the dark on uh, mineral oil and uh, other vehicles that are used to help deliver oxalic acid with a fogger. I understand the appeal because it's inexpensive, but uh, other than that, it's the best I can do. Always direct you to, you know, the science and look at what's approved and, and kind of try to figure it out from there. I just don't know more about it. And uh, Dude Dude says, white oak don't crack. Ships were made from them. Ships. Let's just, ships are in the water. And the oak that's in the water does not dry completely out. So I know a little bit about ships. Wood wool and toe jammed between those joints. And so we're, and that's not a beehive, but uh, white oak on its own, unprotected. I don't know if we could expect that not to crack because we do have problems with the hulls of ships degrading, especially at the water line where there's a lot of drying and wetting going on, but below the water line, they hold really well. Of course, they get attacked by every other sea critter that attaches themselves to it. But, uh, what is a good organic vegetation that is able to kill mites? I don't know if one, oxalic acid comes from vegetation. Formic acid is also coming from plant-based considered organic, uh, but the plants themselves specifically, I don't know if any. Uh, keeping bees in the Yukon territory. To clarify my previous comment about wax boxes in a high fire area, embers flying far, and could easily ignite the wax on a box. Yeah, again, it's not, you know, that could be true. If the wax could be flammable and, and turn your box into a candle somehow, because it's definitely true that if we take bits of wood, this is what I sometimes do with surplus beeswax that I have. I heat it up and I dip little pieces of wood in it. And then that's kindling for my fireplace to get it started because it burns so much longer and then the wax ignites right away. So I could see where that could possibly be true. And Anita says, I tried the fogger with alcohol and it was worthless. Too hard to get the right dosage. So there's Anita. Um, you can ask her questions. She's, she's tested it. Uh, thank you, Fred. If you have a sec, send a shout out to my nine-year-old daughter, Myla. Is it Mila or Myla? She has your visit. Here's a shout out right now. Myla or Mila, I don't know which it is, but I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're watching. I'm glad you're interested in bees and I hope you keep them forever and ever and become the next master, most capable beekeeper ever. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. I'm glad that you were able to make it today. We went an hour and a half, which is a miracle for me. And my internet speeds are up, so you can expect to see more live stream discussions like this one in the future because uh, my internet problems are solved. So thanks for being here on this Sunday afternoon. I hope uh, the discussion can continue down in the comment section down below. Feel free to answer each other's questions. I also invite you to join if you're into Facebook at all. We have a Facebook group that's called The Way to Be. And if you go there, you can talk to one another all over the world, day and night, 24-7. Somebody's there talking about bees. And I don't always have the time to drop in there, but that's why we created it. So people would have a fellowship where they can get answers and share ideas and have a really friendly environment to talk about bees. That's what it's all about. Respect each other's opinions, even if they're completely in contrast to your own. There's no reason to get upset. Share what you do learn what others do, and keep your mind open always to something else that might work better than what you're doing. So thanks a lot for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And for those of you in the other part of the world, happy Monday already. Have a great week.